extremely excited today uh, because there is a topic that gathered my attention several years ago and um, after many steps and moving jumping up and down uh, I managed to finally sit down and being able to talk face to face with one of the persons that are looking this into scientific detail as it's required um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, what are we gonna discuss today uh, when I was young, growing up and younger than what I am now, I had this thought that came to my mind like, wow, if uh, humans have been on the earth for 130,000 years, that's a very conservative estimate, could be longer, a homo sapiens sapiens, uh, identical to modern humans. Why are we saying that we're in the year 2000? I mean, I understand the relevance of the birth of Christ date, and I don't debate that, but I always felt that but way, way before I found out about what we're going to talk here today, I always felt that it would be really meaningful for humanity to have a day that is more representative to the fact that we have been Homo sapiens sapiens thinking humans with the same capacities that you and I have um, for a, at least 130,000 years old. And then one day here, while already living in Moscow, around 2015, I came across with a Joe Rogan podcast that changed my life forever in so many aspects and this uh, was a Randall Carson a conversation with Randall Carson uh, which introduced to me to the idea that uh, there is very strong evidence that 12,900 years ago or around 13,000 years ago there was a comet impact that generated catastrophic a, a set of catastrophic events that had a profound effect on humanity and uh, ever since I have been obsessively talking about this with all my friends I even wrote a record about it and everybody every time I start the topic everybody's like oh no here we go this is gonna last for two hours so finally I got somebody who actually really loves this topic as much as me or maybe even way much more than me and who can actually shed to us some light on what's the science behind these uh, claims and what's going on so I'm very very happy to introduce to you to Dr. Mar Martin Swetman so he's a PhD on theor theoretical physics in the University of Bristol graduated in 1995 He's a scientist at the University of Edinburgh and a fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry. Uh, his research involves statistic analysis of the motion of atoms and molecules to understand the properties of matter. So this is a person who really knows his statistics very well. And thanks to his, this knowledge, he has helped the world to solve one of the greatest puzzles on Earth, the meaning of ancient artworks stretching back over 40,000 years. He has a great book life-changing book called Prehistory Decoded. I strongly recommend you to buy it. And uh, he has an amazing YouTube channel. It's all going to be in the description below. So that being said, I'm very happy to introduce you to Martin Swetman. Welcome to the Leo Perez show, my friend. You are live. How are you? Hi. Yeah, I'm fine. Thank you. Thanks, Leo. Thanks for the introduction. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm excellent, uh, especially now that I have had have the chance to talk to you. And uh, I finally can give a link to my mom that will make her happy that I'm not just a, a crook about this and that I, it's not that I pulled this off my boots or something. <laughs> <laughs> That's always good. <laughs> That's always good. You know, you know, yeah, I, I, this is this is such a controversial topic and I really don't understand why it is considering the evidence that there is around uh, and considering the amount of people that are pushing this idea. Um, I don't know if you would like, I, I'm really interested very briefly to know how does a chemist end up ends up doing this i know you have answered this question online already but let's make this conversation a whole package and how did this happen how did it happen well i, I mean i've always been interested in um all sorts of you know strange mysterious things and as a scientist you, you approach them with a scientific mind and you, you try to think logically through you know is this reasonable can this happen and, and so and I was interested in um, Gebekli Tepe uh, for, a, for a long time, since it was discovered in um, 1995, or it was made public anyway in 2005. I think. And uh, yeah, so I was, I was interested, and finally I got around to, to reading, um, I've, been, I've been reading all the literature about it anyway, and finally I got around to reading um, Graham Hancock's book, Magicians of the Gods, Yes. Where they, where he describes um, this this pillar forty three, this this also known sometimes as the vulture stone, and he started to describe um, how perhaps some of the uh, the animal symbols on this pillar at this 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 site, Quebec Tepe, um, might be describing a scene in the sky, and it might be referring to a date. 
using precession of the equinoxes. Yeah. And I could see already that, that a few of the animal patterns that had matched with the constellations was, were reasonable. Uh, and so that was intriguing. But for, from what was in the book, it could also just be a coincidence because there's only a couple sure. of um, animal symbols matched to um, constellations. So it could easily be, that could easily just be a coincidence. But anyway, I followed it up and I, I thought, well, maybe there's something to this. And I, so I kept on looking and yeah, and apparently it just fell out over the next couple of days that actually, wow, it's probably correct. In fact, I could then, um, having um, like interpreted this pillar almost entirely, I could then um, uh, develop a statistical analysis of this, the chance that this was uh, this matchup between all the animal symbols and the constellations that we think they are. The chance that this could happen just by random, you know, by chance. And it was extremely small. So that gave me um, confidence that actually this pillar really was um, describing a date. Uh, and it turned out to be a very important date, <laughs> yeah. which is what this uh, this podcast is all about. So be, uh, before we carry on, I want to make a small uh, parenthesis here and explain to people who have never encountered these topics that there are, in this moment, we are handling two claims on the table. One claim is that a very ancient construction who... Can you please uh, confirm to me what do you think is the date of construction and the date of purposeful covering? Well, the earliest radiocarbon date that has been found at the site yet, so, so far, is um, 9,000, roughly 9,600 BC. The date written on this pillar, according to our interpretation, is 10,850 BC to within about 75 years or so. All right, so we we have a pardon. I just want to make a quick quick parenthesis before before we carry on. We have a very ancient structure that uh, I want to insist to everybody who is seeing this that this is not that somebody just found it and it was a random guy. We're talking about the German Institute of Archaeology, directed by Klaus Schmidt, which is a very was sadly due to his death. He was a very big authority in this topic. They directed an ex excavation in a place that revealed that there is this megalithic structure that we didn't know of before that challenges the the basic assumptions that many archaeologists have had across the years. And that's one claim that we're going to discuss in this program. And the second claim is that, well, when you start digging the soil and you get to a point that uh, corresponds to approximately 13,000 years ago, you start finding this black mat of material that it, that contains several chemical signatures of something that looks like a asteroid, uh, sorry, a comet impact. And uh, this has led a huge debate that Martin has covering, covered very well. So I give it back to you there. I just wanted to make this parenthesis so people understand what are the claims that we're discussing. A comet most likely hit the Earth 13,000 years ago, and there was already a structure. Oh, uh, uh, do you believe that structure was built after the comet impact, if I understand correctly? Uh, well, nobody can know that yet. Nobody so um, it's, it's an open question but um, I'm, I'm fairly sure that it was built um, quite a long time before the archaeologists currently working at the site mm. think it was built and I mean in fact the, the current um, um, extent of the of the um, of the excavations is only a small fraction of of the site so uh, there have been um, ground penetrating radar surveys of the site performed and it's clear that the current excavations cover about a five to ten percent of the total site um, so there's plenty of scope for Gebekli Tepe to be much older, not just older than the, the, the current radiocarbon dating, but perhaps even older than the date that uh, we think this, this pillar is giving. So it potentially, you know, it could be much older, but we'll have to wait and see. So the, the third claim that I needed to complete to wrap up, wrap up this parenthesis is that when you personally encounter this information through Graham Hancock's book, and also through the literature that you were reading back then, suggested you that there was the, the positioning of the animals in that pillar, which is, uh, if you guys want to Google it, it's called Pillar 43, uh, Gobakli Tepe. That will show you plenty of information. And also in Martin's book, you can see it uh, even better. Uh, so your basic claim was that, well, after you observe that, there there is a very minuscule, almost impossible chance that this is just random positioning of the animals there has to be some information coded there am i right yeah and it's pretty clear that there is information in on on this pillar anyway uh, because um although it's covered with animal symbols there are also some more abstract symbols so h symbols and, and, and v shapes and 
uh, and there are other abstract symbols on other pillars of Quebec Tepe. So it's clear that the, the people were communicating something using a combination of abstract symbols and these these animal figures. Uh, so you know, we're, it's it's kind of obvious that these are not just animals. It's something more. Right. They're, they're telling us some kind of story using these animals and and the other symbols. Had, had there been in history, um, this was a claim that you think it, it it's original to you, or historically there has been continuous suggestion that the ancients were coding information using animal uh, imagery, for example. Of course, we see it, but I would like to hear your opinion. That's a good question. Um, information, possibly. I mean, there there, there are some archaeoastronomical archaeoastronomical studies that have previously suggested um, that, for instance, the some of the animal symbols in cave art mm -hmm. are astronomical and relate to constellations. Uh, it turns out. Um, so this is work by um, uh, Rappengluck. Turns out that it, it's that is almost certainly correct as well. Um, it's just that they've got the constellations wrong, so the animal symbol um, constellation associations were wrong, and, and we've now probably decoded those uh, correctly. So I think yes, uh, it's uh, there were suspicions that um, animal symbols going right back into prehistory might be conveying some kind of information, and, and now essentially we've pretty much proven that as far as you can uh, in using the scientific method and statistics what was for you the um, the smoking gun in terms of the the literature published i mean i think well maybe the, it was not a smoking gun it was more like a smoking arsenal of weapons there because i mean there's so much uh, papers published but uh, when one reviews your work there is a very exhaustive um a review of the literature that that is connected to this topic and were you questioning this along the way or were you always certain that this was something that there was something there um do you mean in terms of the animal symbols no representing information or I, I'm, i'm making a now a little younger dry as detour for a moment and discussing okay, okay. And uh, was there a catastrophic event? Uh, when did you consider this as a serious idea and what led you to consider this as a serious idea? Well, I'd never heard of it before I read Graham Hancock's book either. So it was all new to me. And uh, so then I quickly decoded uh, Pillar 43 and, uh, and a few other pillars. And at that point, I thought, wow, this, this is amazing. And uh, if this is correct, if it's referring to the date of this event, then I better go and check that uh, the science underpinning this catastrophic event is, is solid. Uh, and that led me down through hundreds and hundreds of papers um, trying to understand uh, you know, the, the state of the science. So, and there's a lot there. So there's not, it's not just um, the, the, um, the debate around the Younger Dryas impact event, this, this comet impact. There's the debate around the astronomy So this is all to do with what's known as the torrid meteor stream, um, which, which still orbits in space, in near Earth space, um, although it's probably now decayed uh, substantially from uh, where it was tens of thousands of years ago. So there's the, the, the <laughs> yes. So the, there's the ash, there's the astronomy, uh, and then once I started thinking about the, the connections and what this could mean in terms of Quebec Tepe, then then I had to go into the the academic literature for the archaeology too. So I, I've kind of surveyed, surveyed as much as I needed to, to, to create this uh, consistent picture in my mind of, of what, could, what could have happened. So, so yeah. for, for you, the entry to the topic was through Gobakli Tepe and not through the Younger Dryas uh, impact hypothesis. That's right, yes, yeah, that's absolutely. And, but but were you, were you, when, you, when you encountered Gobakli Tepe, You were absolutely unaware of the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis, or where did this information arrive to you at the same time? Yeah, I was unaware. So um, what? what was, uh -huh, excuse me. Go ahead. Yeah, so I was just I was just interested in Gebekli Tepe. I could see that um, you know this was an amazing site. This was widely acknowledged that it was uh, almost a, well an anomalous site, and it, and because of the animal symbols, it was extremely intriguing. You know what what could they possibly mean? But I had no idea. Um, What the symbols meant, and I didn't know anything about um, the Younger Dryas impact at that time. So it's really through reading Graham's book um, that I, there's a, the, the first sort of key to, to decoding um, Gebekli Tepe, and which I then continued 
and then that got me into the all the other sides of the science too when i when i was reading your book i had to translate the word maverick because uh, i'm not a not, <laughs> i'm not a <laughs> i'm not a, a, a english is not my first language so i, I had to translate the word maverick and, and i must say that uh, i really love graham and his passion for the for for the the discovery of this topic is key for for many people like me to arrive here but i really like the fact that you chose the path that is not the maverick one it's like well okay let's stay inside because i mean i think that in order to change the system and look it took, I'm, i'm a person who came from playing punk music to well i still play punk punk music and and i have a pretty open mind but you know that classic uh, advice of your dad like hey man to change the system is better to do it from inside rather than from outside And I, before we carry on, I just want to give a sense of appreciation from the fact that you have uh, adopted a very rigorous uh, method uh, to, to, um, to, to, to support the evidence for these uh, ideas that you're putting on the table. And so let's, let's talk to people a little bit about, I think along the way, again, I said we have three claims. There was a cosmic impact. There, there is this um, uh, site that challenges the knowledge that we had before. And the third claim, which is your personal claim, is that, well, uh, uh, Martin believes that we can look at these symbols and uh, understand some information from that. And to uh, explain to people a little bit what happened, I'm going to bring an image to the table and then I'm going to give you the, 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 the information from there. It's an image. Uh, it's an image. It's going to appear in the screen in a moment. It's an image from Pillar 43. Let me just share my screen here one second and then, yeah, here. So... Um, All right, so uh -huh, here it is. So the reason why I wanted to put this image uh, in the center of our conversation right now is because there, uh, you can clearly see there that there is a set of animals there. And there is a scorpion. And so if I believe, if I understood your work correct, correctly, are you seeing the image of the scorpion at the moment? If yeah. I'm correct? Uh -huh, yeah. 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 Uh, if I understood correctly, um, this was your initial point to start guiding your your interpretation of this. Is this a good way to see it? Yeah, so that was already um, in Graham's book. Um, the, the, and, you know, I, I guess at that time, as, as I read that, I thought, well, it seems unlikely that, uh, very unlikely that um, our present day constellations could be so old. Um, you know, that the current understanding is that, or accepted belief, if you like, is that the constellations, our, our present day constellations were invented by Mesopotamians in perhaps the first or second millennium BC. But that's just a belief. Um, we don't know when they were invented. All we know is that they were recorded by the Mesopotamians. So as a scientist, you know, I, that kind of information doesn't really uh, distract me too much because I, I, I know that, that these things could have been, uh, could have existed much earlier. So I could I could quite easily accept that the possibility of, of these being representing our, our modern day constellations. Uh, yeah, so the scorpion, it sort of gets you into the problem. You're matching the scorpion with Scorpius. And then it's a case of working out what is the probability that all these other animal symbols could match up with the constellations around Scorpius. And moreover, we, we could interpret the, 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 the animal symbols along the top of the pillar as well, which are um, which represent the constellations according to our interpretation. Which represent the constellations on the other is the the eagle vulture animal with the little ball on its wing. We think that represents the constellation Sagittarius on the summer solstice. So the, the three at the top next to the so-called handbags are the other constellation, uh, other equinoxes and solstices. There was a small pause in the audio from the transmission. Uh, can you go go back a minute? You know, we have we had scor we had scorpion. A constellation and we have a set of animals around it you calculated the probability of those animals being set to random and then we had a small cut in the conversation and maybe you can go one step backwards so i mean so you, you assume that the scorpion does represent the scorpius constellation if that's your sort of starting assumption and then you ask the question well, what is what is the chance of all these other animal symbols on the pillar lining up and matching the other constellations uh, in the sky, and according to this, this notion that the, the three animals at the top of the pillar next to their so-called handbags are the other solstice and equinoctial 
constellations. What is the chance of that happening by random? And you can do a calculation um, which suggests it's extremely tiny. And, and so what you, what you need to do is just consider, well, how many possible combinations of animal symbols on the pillar are there? That's given, a brilliant no, given, assumption. Given the number of um, animal symbols available, like Gebekli Tepe, and the number of positions on the pillar that you need to fill. And it works out that there are hundreds of millions of different combinations that are possible, that, that where the animal symbols could have been placed. And then you ask, well, how many of those combinations are as good as the one on the pillar at matching um, the constellations in the sky uh, according to this particular interpretation of the pillar representing a date? And, you, and when, you do, when you ask that, you, you see that actually very few, there are very few possible combinations that could match so well, at least, but there is some uncertainty there because we're now matching constellations to animal yes. shapes. So there's some uncertainty there, but we can take that into account through this um, statistical method. Um, so there's a degree of uncertainty. But also the number of animals are not just infinite. So, so you, you have a certain sample size that allows you to narrow your statistical modeling. Am I correct to see it like that? Yeah. So, so as I said before, there are, there are a couple of hundred million different combinations of animal symbols on the pillar. And according to my view of how well the animal symbols match the constellations, only a few of them are as good as the one on the pillar at describing this date. So you've got a, a small number of just a couple divided by a few hundred million, that gives you the chance that this could have happened completely at random. And, and, and this led you to investigate ancient cave paintings, right? To see if there was any underpinning of this theory that preceded, not this theory, but this, this method of, uh, of seeing constellation that preceded the Gobakli Tepe construction, right? Yeah, sure. I mean, once, once you see this, <clears throat> it's the, one of the first things you think about is, well, how far back does this go? Because, you know, this is, this date is talking about uh, 13,000 years ago, nearly. And probably this system, which is writing a date using constellations or animal symbols, probably wasn't invented just to describe this particular event, this, sure. this catastrophic event. Probably this kind of information, this knowledge already existed perhaps for thousands of years. So just how old is it? You know, and, and really there's, You shouldn't put a, a limit on that as a scientist. It's a, you can't say, no, it can't be more than 15,000 years old. You have to open your mind and say, well, realist, you know, what is, how far back does this go? So then you can take uh, the interpretation you have from Gebekli Tepe, and then <clears throat> you can apply that to um, asking or to predicting, essentially. We, we, we take the, the interpretation from Gebekli Tepe and then we then predict the the age or the dates of paintings for these animal symbols in uh, Paleolithic cave art. So this was another paper. And what we found was that in just about every single case, we could predict the radiocarbon date of uh, an animal painting in cave art extremely well. And again, the, uh -huh. chance, of that hap the chance of that happening, the chance of that happening purely by random is about, is again, is, is one in about uh, half a billion Or, or even or even more so uh, the key there is quite that, the key there is that you were using constellations to to um, predict i mean it's like okay well look this painting has these four animals um and and the radiocarbon dating suggests that it was generated in this date so let's go and see what should be the constellations that are am I, i want to know if i'm understanding it correctly Let, let's go and see at the constellations that should be on the sky at the equinoxes um and solstices and then this will if this matches with the radiocarbon dating it means that there has to be something there is this a correct way to see it yeah essentially um so we we you, let's take an example um you look at one of the uh let's say a horse painting in lasco cave now the horse according to our interpretation represents the constellation leo in this ancient zodiac And the constellation Leo, uh, it could have been painted, according to our, our theory, it could have been painted either because it was the summer, winter solstice or because there was a, an autumn or equinox, uh, uh, a spring or autumn equinox. Yes. Uh, according to procession of the equinoxes, where that, um, which lined up with Leo, which represents the horse. So we can ask, now that, that possibility of that happening is about one in three by pure chance. 
So for that one single painting, the chance of our prediction being correct is about one in three. But you then ask, well, you know, one in three is it's not very small, so that could be completely, um, you know, the chance of that happening is, is quite high. So exactly. that could, it could just be quite, that could just be chance. So then you keep asking the same question, well, can we make this prediction for all of the animal paintings, which have got good radiocarbon dates in the, in the academic literature? And what you find is that, yes, every time we make, just about every time we make uh, a prediction for the radiocarbon date of one of these animal paintings, it agrees uh, with, with the actual radiocarbon date. Now the chance of it, because it's one third for each animal symbol and we have uh, a database of over 30 well-dated animal symbols in, in European Paleolithic cave art, that, so that, that chance of a third builds up and eventually it becomes so tiny that this could be random this could have occurred by at random, that uh, we have to conclude that actually our hypothesis is almost certainly correct. And there are two things here. We generated this ancient zodiac and the hypothesis by studying Gebekli Tepe, and we then mm -hmm. make predictions for the cave art, and it still works, um, <laughs> with such a tiny chance uh, of being wrong. How has been the, the response of the academic uh, world about this proposal? Uh, Zero, I think. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely I'm, nothing. I'm not surprised. Yeah, <laughs> um, I, I, you know, I try to um, uh, make people aware of it and highlight it whenever I can. But uh, in terms of serious uh, academic response to this, no. All, all I've got so far are, are basically discussions from a few few people on Twitter that this can't possibly be true. But of course. Mm -hmm. I'm a scientist. I, I have to go by what the data says, and, and the data is absolutely clear. I'm quite, uh, I'm quite enamored of Ka uh, Carl Jung's work, and for me, it's it's one of the fundamentals in my life. And I just remind you in his biography that when he when he started pushing his ideas, I mean, there was zero reaction from the academic community until a certain point. And this is a this is a cycle that happens all the time. Whenever something that is a breakthrough, it's pushed on the table, and uh, that's a. I, I, once again, going back to Graham's uh, approach to all of this, and I want to know your feelings about that. He he stands very much in confrontation with the scientific world, as if there is some sort of conspiracy theory behind it. And I really don't agree with that point of view personally, because it's not that there is a conspiracy theory. I, I like a quote by by uh, a political commentator called Ben Shapiro. I, I just enjoy an idea that he says, which is, "Don't attribute to genius what you can attribute to stupidity." I think this is not just his quote. I mean, it's a famous uh, idea, and uh, and I think that that to think that there is a mastermind pulling a lever in some sort of laboratory to stop this information to come out to the public is way much more complicated than just to assume that for scientists and academics it's very hard to just change their life's work because some random guy came and just put this new theory there, and so there is a natural rejection uh, that it doesn't come from some sort of organized committee. It just comes from the individual. Do you do you see it like that as well, or you are more in the academic world? So perhaps you you have seen these these vectors, you know, that are aimed to stop something. Oh wow! Maybe it's a <laughs> bit a of both. Deb Maybe it's a bit of a both. Big, that's a big debate. Um, <clears throat> I respect yeah, it. If you I don't mean, want to enter there. Uh, that's that's. It's it's a part of the scientific process. You, know, you, you put forward a proposal, and then. Um, you, you need to, you need good evidence, especially if your proposal is is very odd or, or very uh, if it's very <clears throat> contradicts current understanding. So you, you need very good evidence, but I think we have that now. So I think the discussion should should start um, that takes this seriously. Um, do I do I do I um, think that other people should always use a scientific method? No, that's not reasonable, is it? Um, not everyone can be a scientist, so. I think you have to, to respect other people's ways of trying to um, attain their knowledge. Uh, nevertheless, you know, I, as a, you know, I would say as a scientist, the, the best approach to finding truth as far as you can is through the scientific method because it's based on statistics and statistics are just based on logic. Uh, so, you know, ultimately, it's fine to have an idea and to put it forward and to say, hey, what about this? But if you really want to have it considered seriously, then you need to take it down the scientific uh, route. If, if I am correct, you are a chemist whose uh, nine to five job is to identify patterns in subatomic particles. Is, is this a correct way to see it or molecular at the molecular level? Is this a good way to describe your, your yeah. 
Yeah, so it's so the kind of work that I do, it tries to link um, the properties of molecules to the properties of matter, essentially. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the way that you can do that is by, by studying uh, the way that the molecules organize themselves, the way that they arrange themselves in, in different types of matter, and the way that they, and their motion, the way that they vibrate and move around due to heat. Um, so, uh, so that whole business is about um, quantifying the statistics of different arrangements and motions. That's why I asked this question, and because and it model. seems like the guy, the guy that was going to come across with this uh, kind of vision was a person who can spot those kind of um, patterns in, 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 in such a vast data set. Yeah, so the, the, what I just described earlier about the, the Pillar 43 is exactly the kind of problem uh, that we would uh, we might consider in this this kind of work that I do as as my professional work. So you know how how many different configurations of atoms or molecules are there? How, how likely is this specific configuration of atoms and molecules compared to that general number of possibilities? So th- this kind of quantification is, is something I do routinely. You know, it's, it's part of the, the subject that I study. So pillar forty three for me, or decoding it was just kind of taking what I do for my day job and just applying it to this this pillar but noticing that there is a bit of uncertainty with, with matching the, the animal shapes to the constellations. And that's, that's been the problem, if you like, with getting that, um, that, that uh, interpretation of Gebeki Tepe accepted, is that there is this uncertainty. Um, however, anyone that challenges me on this interpretation uh, has to also uh, be honest with themselves and address that uncertainty them, themselves. So anyone that wants to challenge me has to also say what they think um, the correct ordering is of exactly. the constellations with the, with the animal patterns. And if they don't do that, then they can't have an opinion. Uh, so, so all of my critics on this issue, they say, oh, I can't possibly be true. But when I say, well, provide your ranking table, which is the way that we, we do this comparison, for the constellations versus animal symbols, and they don't because they know that if, they, if, they have to, if they're forced to provide this ranking table, then they will have to agree with me. Yes, I'm assuming that, that my audience my audience will have the same problem that I had to, to grasp the power of this idea. And I'm going to, for the number time number three, I think, I'm going to repeat it. You're a person who observed an uh, ancient structure, and this ancient structure had a set of animals. And so you were like, okay, that could be random. But being a person who understands statistics very well, you, you plotted a statistical model that looks at that positioning, the positioning of those animals and calculates the probability of that being random, taking a a couple of uh, assumptions as basic, uh, being that, for example, okay, well, look, it seems pretty, uh, because also the position, I mean, the the main point is not just what animals are there. It's like, which one is here, which one is here, which one is here, which one is here. If I were to grab my one-year-old son and give him 13 uh, figures of animals and just tell him, okay, uh, he, his name is Sidious, by the way. Okay, Sidious. Um, <laughs> throw all these this, uh, animals on the table. It would produce a random distribution. And, and, exactly. And, and so if you would have analyzed the distribution that my son made, you would have perhaps concluded that that distribution was made totally random. But being the scientist you are and being the person who has the statistical knowledge and toolkit that you have, you have concluded that the probability of that distribution being random is negligible. It's almost impossible that this is random. Am I correct? Exactly. That's exactly it. Yeah. So that's and, the point people need to take home. Sorry. Yeah. Carry on. Yeah. And the, and the thing is, more you know, t- going on from that, we we have this now, this hypothesis uh, from Quebec Tempe, and then we apply it to the cave art, and the cave art analysis has no uncertainty in it. It's purely it's a it's purely scientific. There are no uncertainties at all, and we still get this amazing correlation. So combine the two things together. And there's practically no chance that this is wrong. I don't understand. If I will repeat this to a friend, I would not be able to tell him why there is no certainty on the cave side of things. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yes, yeah, so this is what I was talking about before. So that we, we, we predict the age of an individual um, cave painting mm-hmm. of an animal. And the chance that we can get that age uh, correct it's about one in three. That's but carbon we dating. Have a date, That's because of carbon yes. dating. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Sorry. Carbon yes, yes. Uh-huh. So, so, we're, so we're comparing our predicted date using yes. a, what we call our, our zodiacal hypothesis mm-hmm. with the actual date of yeah. the radiocarbon measurement. And that, that comparison, the chance that it would be correct or they would overlap, 
is about one in three. But because we have now a large database of cave paintings, which have been accurately radiocarbon dated, we can do this for, for all of these cave paintings. And there are, there are dozens of them, like over 30. And because it agrees every time we do it, that's, that's basically the, one third to the power of something like 30 chance of that occurring uh, purely by chance. Uh, so, you know, the fact that it, they line up or it agrees so well tells us that, no, this, this isn't just so pure chance. More, this, excuse me, carry on. It's hard sometimes on the distance to not interrupt each other. Sorry. Mm -hmm. No, I, I finished anyway. Carry on. So, so once more to synthesize this, you extrapolated the same technique to, let's say, the Altamira. Altamira is a good example to use, or what is the yeah. better example? Altamira cave in Spain. And so in the Altamira cave, you have a landscape of animals. And then you use the tool, which is very important in your analysis, which is called Stellarium. Stellarium is a tool. There are many tools of such that allows you to go back in time and, and pre not predict, I mean, to accurately show you what was that night sky on a certain epoch. And so what you did, please correct me if I misunderstood, what you did is that you grab the carbon dating of the painting of Altamira, for example, and, and grab also the margin of error that that has, so you, you understand that there is a window. And so you plotted the, sky, the night sky uh, on that epoch, and then you see what constellations should be there on the equinoxes and the solstices. And then using the zodiac that you developed by analyzing Gobakli Tepe, you realize that the likelihood of those paint uh, cave paintings, uh, the, uh, the likelihood of the fact that those cave paintings are showing constellations are, is extremely high. Is this a good way to frame it? No, that the probability uh, that the matches, that the agreement that we get, our predictions, mm -hmm. is extremely low uh, mm -hmm. if we assume what's called the null hypothesis. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the probability of this agreement occurring by pure chance is, yeah. is almost zero. Exactly. So the fact that it does occur means that it's almost certainly correct. Exactly, exactly. So, so that gave you the capacity to build a, 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 a zodiac uh, of constellations yeah. that precedes our current zodiac. And, and, and as a person who have gone through your work, I see that there are a lot of similarities and a lot of differences. Do you think that the, the uh, I mean, in, this, in the sense that many animals are still kept preserved in our current uh, zodiac and, and some animals were replaced, uh, do you think that the Younger Dryas event was the moment that that produced that shift in between the old zodiac and the new zodiac, or do you have any ideas on where this transition happens? Uh, <laughs> Man, that's a hard question. <laughs> I tough, know, tough one. I, I know well, that there may be not an answer. Yeah, but we're we're only just really starting on this journey to try and track the evolution of the ancient zodiac across, well, at the moment, Western Eurasia, but possibly beyond. So it's really quite, it's really early days to, to try and understand how this, this whole thing evolved. Sure, um, sure. I, I think even before Gebekli Tepe, there were a couple of variations that we can see. So um, uh, for instance, Pisces, uh, possibly um, the fish symbol already existed for Pisces back in the Paleolithic art. Um, but at Gebekli Tepe, we see like a bending bird. So there are representing Pisces according to our interpretation. So we see already that there are a couple of, of variations uh, in this ancient zodiac. And as time moves forward, I think those variations increase. I had, I had, uh, sorry, carry on, excuse me. Well, until we get to, to Mesopotamia and then the Mesopotamians, it seemed made quite a lot of changes. Um, and that's the point where um, current scholarship would say the constellations began. But I'm saying, no, that's, that's just where the Mesopotamians made quite a few swaps and they, they changed some of the animal symbols for other objects like the scales for Libra and so on. Um, so that it, it was quite a, a big transition uh, in Mesopotamia in yeah. the Zodiac. What is your, how do you feel about this? Uh, whenever I think about the history of humanity, not Homo sapiens sapiens, I, I think 100, again, I started with this model of 130,000 years. And I, and that's, again, that's, that's a very conservative date. And I'm saying it on purpose just to be conservative because it could, be, it could be twice that, or maybe some people push it to a million years, but let's just use a conservative number. You agree with that number, 130,000 years, Homo sapiens sapiens? Um, well, I think there have been reports from Africa putting it back between two to 300,000. Yeah. Um, that's my latest understanding. Let's, let's use 200,000 years. Okay, 200,000 years of anatomically identical humans. What I understand is that if you find the skull of that human and you mix it up 
with a modern human, you will not understand the difference. Is, is this correct to see it like that? I believe so, yeah. I believe so. So what is the standard explanation for the fact that we only have 10,000 years of history and then 190,000 years of silence? When you speak with your colleagues, I mean, and or people in the scientific world, because for us outside the sciences, it's easier to have these conversations, but... But what is the quote-unquote serious explanations that accounts for that? Because it sounds preposterous yeah. to me. To be honest, that's outside of my my mm -hmm. field, and I, I I'd just be speculating sure. on that. So I, I can't really speak to that. All I would say is that you know it does take some time for technology to evolve, and I, I suspect that the more basic your technology, the slower that evolution is. So it's kind of like an exponential yeah. curve. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Um, in terms of you know, development no when i look uh, at I this because it's very attractive for now we're we're moving away a little bit from claim c which was we can see a pattern in this in this uh, pillar 43 and then make an ancient zodiac and then extrapolate that to ancient paintings and have some sort of picture of how the ancients were looking at the night sky so we're moving away from this uh one second when you start because the, then appears so many questions why there why there is that silence? Is that silence is because people were not speaking or is it because there was a bottleneck event that just shrinked everything to a, to a situation in which most of the information that was happening there was, was destroyed and, um, or forgotten? And that's the um, basic assumption of many of the things we're, ha we're discussing right now, which is the Younger Dryas impact event. Um, it's very, it's very um, uh, seductive for people like me who are not scientific and, uh, and who are starting to have a dialogue with these ideas to imagine that there were this like uh, you know super advanced uh, uh, space bearing civilization before that was not, uh, brought down by a comet impact and then I really don't believe that I agree exactly with what you just said I think that when I describe uh, the situation and how I see it is that you know when the sea when the when the ocean is breaking waves the waves arrive to a certain level and then they pull back right and then the, the wave car the wave carries more energy and then it when the wave breaks it just like the shore gets wet just a bit further and so we have what I think and I really agree with Randall Carlson's vision of this what I think that is happening is that there has been cycles of civilizations and this is absolutely speculative zero percent scientific it's just my not my feeling as a as an individual uh, there has been cycles of civilizations that are uh, repeated uh, repeatedly deterred by cosmic events or per perhaps sociological events uh, i don't know and um and that for me it's one of the points of view one of the angles that attracted me more of this about this topic because then you start feeling that you're not just the consequence and the product of just one iteration of, of civilization or just a linear evolution of things but then perhaps there is a cycle of things happening underneath uh, is this something that you feel as well or or are you more linear in the way everything evolved in your understanding of how everything evolved this is a personal opinion of course i'm not asking for your scientific opinion because i really like that it's, you, it, yeah. it, it's something i discuss in my book um mm -hmm. so if you go back far enough you know half a million years or more um you know homo sapiens didn't exist so there, clearly there is some there are some genetic changes needed um for us to get to the kind of um technological uh state that we're now in so it's not just going to going to happen there have to be changes and so you can then ask the question what which point were there sufficient changes when you know um humans could then develop a technological age and i don't think that's that's known but probably we're talking hundreds of thousands if not you know half a million years or more mm -hmm. so then like as you were saying that what what prevented us developing quickly once we'd achieved those genetic changes uh, and so then probably you know, you're, you're, the pace of development is exponential, probably. So you have to allow for this this gradual growth. But still, yeah. there could have been time at some point for um, technology to to develop um, more rapidly. So, so you know, what prevented it? And, and there is there is this question is asked in academic academic uh, circles as well. There are papers asking this very question: Why were there not? Uh, why did agriculture only begin apparently? Um, 11,000 years ago and not say 20,000 years ago. So there are different um, different ideas. One is possibly um, rapid climate change. That, that is certainly a possibility. If you go back into the ice age, the last ice age, 
there were these dramatic fluctuations in, in climate and temperature in the northern hemisphere at least. So that's one possibility that um, <clears throat> simply having a, a rapid change in climate could prevent, uh, you know, a particular group of people would be adapted to their environment. And if that changes very suddenly, then suddenly they, they kind of have to start again. So that's a possibility. There's also a possibility, possibility that those rapid changes in climate were caused by an external factor like a, a cosmic impact. And according to this theory, if, if you know, um, the younger Dras impact hypothesis so only really makes sense if you also take into account the torrid meteor stream uh, in, uh, in Earth's environment, which suggests that there would have been other cosmic impacts, not just the younger Dryas impact, although that may have been by far the largest one, but there should be other uh, cosmic impacts that we can observe uh, in, in prehistory. So th these might have led to, if you like, some kind of constraint on, on human developing. So yes. it's quite possible that there could have been um, some developments towards civilization, perhaps even creating some early civilizations, and then they were wiped out. The problem, the problem is that we don't actually have any clear evidence of any pre-existing civilizations before about 11,000 or 12,000 years ago. So if you really want to be scientific about it and say, you know, what evidence is there? for these for any pre-existing civilization there isn't really any that i know of perhaps your but, but here here my little light bulb shines in my head i mean in order for you to have a global culture because i mean the claim that there is a zodiac that is common to africa and and uh, there is a, a you were, in one of your videos you were discussing um a cave painting in the, the philippines am i correct or indonesia was yeah it? Yeah, in the Philippines. That's right, Indonesia. So, Indonesia. So, so that 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 means that there is some sort of there seems to be some sort of global culture back then. Do you agree or? Yeah, yeah. So, so again, this. I, so, what I have found in terms of cave paintings in Western Europe, we see similar cave paintings across. Well, in in eastern uh, eastern Eurasia as well. So, in East Asia in the Philippines and, and Indonesia, we see similar paintings and uh, and the style is very similar. If you look around the world at different um, peoples, their art quite yes. is usually quite quite different. So in South America, the artwork is very different to the artwork of, of um, Western Europe. However, these, these animal cave paintings they appear not just in Western Europe, but uh, in other places, as I said, in East Asia. So perhaps there is a connection there. That's something that we could look into. But um, but anyway, even in Western Europe, these animal paintings in the caves go back about forty thousand years, and and all the time, every every animal symbol that we look at that is well dated from the radiocarbon method agrees with our zodiacal hop hypothesis. So we can say, well, perhaps this this zodiac existed maybe even forty thousand years ago. You know, the, the data is consistent with that. So then we ask, well, when was this? system invented was it 40,000 years ago or was it before we, we just we, d we don't know <laughs> that's as far back as we can currently go uh, yes. but it could have been before yes. there's a very in there's a very interesting um site somewhere in germany and i forget the name mm -hmm. of uh, which is associated with um uh hu humans before homo sapiens sapiens mm -hmm. I, I think i forget which type it is uh, but the archaeological excavation shows that there appears to be some kind of circular altar. And in the, in the vicinity of that circular altar, they have found the animal bones pretty much identical or very nearly identical to this ancient zodiac we've <laughs> decoded. Now, the date of this, That's amazing. Um, of this supposed pre-Homo sapiens altar site is about 300,000 years old. That's in Germany. Amazing. Does it go that back that far? We, who, who knows? knows? In here, I, <laughs> I, I want to add, once again, I, I mean, I really respect the scientific community, so I don't expect anything that I say to be taken seriously. Uh, it's just a friend saying something. Um, in here, I would like to add, again, the work of Carl Jung, because something that really called my attention, and I'm going to make an ex I'm going to use an example to say something else. And, the, and the, I'm going to start by the end of my idea. Perhaps in something like what I'm about to say is where you can find the origin of such a system. Uh, if you show a, 
monkey that has never seen a snake. If you show them, this is a fact, and it can be totally corroborated by anybody who listens to this video. If you show to a monkey that has never seen a snake, a plastic snake, imagine a monkey that was raised in, ca in captivity, the monkey will react to that snake. The monkey has a circuitry to understand snake even before it sees snake. Uh, and it, it is not unscientific to say, and everybody who wants to check this can go and check it, that the brain has certain circuitry that are adapted for us to, to uh, that have evolved for us to, in order for us to survive. And I wouldn't be surprised if, in, if, if this kind of circuitry is what leans us towards producing a system like that. It's something perhaps innate in our, in our mind that makes the connections, you know, between the heavens and the animals. And, and I wouldn't be surprised. Well, mm -hmm. There's, I think there's a very, I think it's a very reasonable point of view that, you know, as even before humans earlier, that's where species of humans, would have been interested in the sky and the stars because every, every animal is uh, adapted to the seasons because all of our resources are seasonal, everything. So it's very important for us to know about seasonality, to track the seasons. And so as soon as you notice that the stars the motion of the stars is uh, is also influenced by the seasons, and and that those patterns gradually evolve in time. You know, as basically, as soon as you notice precession, then that is something that you you can use to your advantage. So I don't I don't see why it has to be just Homo sapiens that uh, might yeah. have used this. The possibility that it, earlier types of human also knew about this. I think is has to be considered. I think one of the reasons why this topic is has so slowly entered into the, the into the conversation of modernity is that we really have a modern centrism and and human centrism of things, and we tend to not look around uh, our world and see how animals operate and how animals and how ancient peoples behave, and also we tend to see them as stupid and and unsophisticated. And that is a very large mistake. I come from a I come from the from Venezuela, which is a country that has a very rich ancient culture still active there, thriving. And their their knowledge is key for our current understanding of the world and it forms a part of my life. And I'm very saddened by the Western mind that has such a disconnect between between ancient tribes, ancient peoples and modernity. And and I think that's one of the reasons why this topic is so hard to push through. Because uh, people imagine that it cannot be that, they, that the Asians had such a sophisticated knowledge of something. Yeah, and, and yes, at the same time, when you, you, when you look at, um, uh, if you like, uh, uh, people that are currently, uh, you know, sort of um, lost tribes, you know, so-called lost tribes of, of the Amazon and so on, uh, and other people like this, they don't seem to have this astronomical knowledge, or maybe I'm mm. mistaken. So, mm -hmm. so it, it doesn't seem that it was everywhere. Um, but uh, and, and why that's the case, I don't know. There is a tribe in Namibia. I'm just trying to. Um, I, I, wait, wait. Uh, there is a tribe in Africa that has the knowledge of Sirius actually being a dual star system. By the way, which is a pretty. Are you familiar with this? Yeah. So this is the, this is the whole Dogon thing. The Dogon, yes. Quite, I'm quite dubious about uh, all of these associations because I, I wonder to what extent we're kind of imprinting our modern Could be. knowledge Could be, on, on 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 the sort of ancient understandings. Yeah, I think that it's better it's better to leave that topic alone because we really don't know, and it's not exactly um, relevant to what we're discussing now. Well, or it is because I mean we want to understand if ancient peoples had an inclination towards uh, astronomy and. I don't know, whenever I see ancient architecture, it seems to be that it was pretty important for them. But we're trying to discuss something even further back in time. Is it innate in animals? I always thought, my, my inclination is that, yes, I always had a joke with one of my best friends who is a philosopher. And we were just joking that somewhere in the Arctic tundra, there are two birds that all of a sudden look at each other. And they, make, and they don't speak, right? They just look at each other. And then, boom, they fly 13,000 kilometers down south. Like, so they... They have some pretty good understanding of what's going in their environment and when they have to move and why. And uh, anyways, we're in the realm of speculation. So that's another part of the of the conversation that's better to have offline. Um, there are there are other parallel topics that start appearing when when one starts thinking about something like this. Um, so let's go to the to the asseveration that an impact may have a cosmic impact may have had a very, very significant effect in human evolution in the last 
in the last 13,000 years. At the moment, uh, if I understand, you believe this to be a fact? Uh, the, the evidence for the Younger Dryas impact is so overwhelming, I, 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 I don't think it's reasonable anymore to deny it. Um, I think it's uh, absolutely clear that this happened, that it was covered almost an entire hemisphere in terms of its damaging effects, uh, and that Gebekli Tepe uh, almost certainly was built, um, or at least part of it was, was constructed in response to this event. And I think it's also the case that Gebekli Tepe is by far the earliest example or instance of what we would call civilization or the beginnings of civilization. So you can connect these two events together. There seems to be some kind of causality between this event and Gebekli Tepe, and therefore uh, Gebekli Tepe is at the origin of this, this region that was at the center of this region called the Fertile Crescent from where agriculture and um, uh, growing populations sort of originated, at least in Western Eurasia. So, yeah, we can kind of connect this, we can make a case anyway for connecting this impact with the origin of civilization in Western Eurasia. And the, the dating is uncanny, right? Because, I mean, th there is geological evidence of, uh, geological and, and chemical evidence of some event of a cosmic nature, and also you have the dating of that site. So they too, whenever you have this kind of match, there seems to be something there. That's right. So we have um, the, from radiocarbon dating studies, we know that this event happened around about 10,835 BC to within 50 years. And according to my analysis of pillar 43, uh, Quebecli Tepe, the date written on that pillar is 10,825, um, I would say, plus or minus 75 years. So it's almost exactly yes, the date, uncanny. the radio. So, and moreover, this pillar has this little figure at the bottom, um, which you showed earlier, I think, of a headless man. So it seems that this pillar is uh, saying something about death, which this, this catastrophe would have um, clearly resulted in a lot of death. And also you, you need some kind of really um, strong motivation to build somewhere like Gebekli Tepe at that time, a completely anomalous site. Yes. So, you know, what, what could have provided the impetus, the motivation to build Gebekli Tepe? It needs to be something dramatic. So it makes all it makes perfect sense that it's this catastrophe that led to the construction of, or at least this part of Gebekli Tepe. Perhaps the other parts of Gebekli Tepe are even older. We don't know that. Let's talk a little bit about uh, catastrophism versus gradualism, because I'm really shocked about how hard it has been to push this uh, this theory in general uh, and and the rejection that it has it has had and especially uh, I mean the, in my in my view correct me if I'm wrong this was the, the first glimpses of something like this were introduced in nine, in the early nineties by Robert Schock and and actually Graham Hancock and John Anthony West with their famous documentary what was the name of the documentary the, the um, well it's the the, the Sphinx redating theory. You follow me there? Uh, well, I mean, gradualism versus catastrophism is a really old debate. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I know, I know, I know, I know. And, and, that, and that, that's why I'm talking about 1993, because that's a pretty modern date. Still, still, the reaction towards this idea was something of the sort of gradualism versus catastrophism echoed in the present. And I'm really shocked. Do you believe that the modern science are kind of in the gradualist or the catastrophist side? Well, I think modern science now accepts catastrophism, but only on long timescales uh, of, say, you know, millions of years. So it, it, until recently, I think um, science would have rejected the idea of, of these global scale catastrophes taking place only 13,000 years ago. It's, it's, the, it's, the, it's because it's so recent that it um, caused so much controversy. Yeah, for... Um, for people who don't know what we're talking about, just in case, there are kind of two currents in science, especially in geology, which is gradualism and catastrophism. And gradualism is the idea that things just slowly evolve over time. And catastrophism takes that into account, but then it spices it up with the fact that there are these events that all of a sudden spark a change that is major and global. And by the way, uh, one of the questions I wanted to ask you is, do you think that the situation that we find ourselves now with COVID-19 perhaps will will speed up this 
debate because I mean not the debate exactly of the younger Dryas but the general perception that yes there are sudden events that nobody was expecting that all of a sudden change the course of everything I guess it will yeah I guess that will add to that that whole debate um, but in terms of cosmic impacts this is a different kind of catastrophe mm -hmm. there is um you know that that it was the um the asteroid that um, led to the demise of the the dinosaur so that wasn't really accepted until about 1990 or so so this is really quite a recent change in right. academia and in and in science so that was like that the, the first uh really um major piece of evidence of catastrophism and then you had from from then we've had uh, other indications um so you have uh there was a uh, comet lady shoemaker mm -hmm. that collided with jupiter i think that was 1994 and that was observed by the Hubble Space Telescope. And since then, the, the database of Earth impact craters has been growing. So there's, there's, been, there's a growing awareness that these impacts happen. But still, it's the, because, of the, because of the view of near-Earth space and how many large asteroids there are, it was never thought that this could have happened so recently. And that's, that's the, the really big challenge now to, to science, is that it's not just asteroids, which are, are the which is what um, NASA, for instance, has been tracking and trying to discover. It's not just asteroids that we have to think about. We need to think about comets and the kind of uh, debris that they leave behind, which are these meteor um, showers. Uh, and, and in particular, the one that um, we know about at the moment is this torrid meteor stream, which is, which is uh, the largest meteor stream in the sky in, in near Earth orbit, which suggests that there was a giant comet um, that entered the inner solar system and decayed on the time scale of a few tens of thousands of years ago. And it was this um, torrid meteor stream which, um, which, which might have resulted in the Younger Dryas impact uh, and perhaps also might have delayed um, uh, the development of, of, of uh, the technological development of, of Homo sapiens over the last few tens of thousands of years. So, anyway, the, this, this debate, I think, has to move on from just thinking about asteroids. We have to think about Comets, not just co the comets we know about, but the comets that are currently in the outer solar system that have the potential to, to come into the inner solar system and cause havoc. And then this is where the debate is at, I think. Now. I see. And, and, and so, so you closing that question up, you, we have made some good progress towards dropping this uh, gradualist only view across the centuries, and we're moving towards a catastrophist um, worldview in which we accept that. So you feel confident that we're moving towards that direction, yeah? Yes, but um, you know you have to take into account that um, different different areas of academia move at different speeds. Sure. So whereas um, you know um, catastrophism might be now basically accepted in in geological and astronomical circles, you then you go into perhaps other disciplines where there is more resistance to it, simply because it, it doesn't have. Uh, because the knowledge isn't there essentially, and it takes time for that to, to feed through and to filter through and to build up. Sure. And, and, and I guess that is why um, people like uh, Graham Hancock and, and others were resisted so much maybe 20 years ago, is because at that time, in the disciplines that they were confronting, archaeology mm -hmm. essentially, yeah. this idea of catastrophism really wasn't accepted at all. Even the, the dinosaur asteroid was still a matter of contention among many in this community. So it just takes time, you know, these, these scientific uh, revolutions, these paradigm changes can take time to filter through. Yeah, yeah. By the way, I, I want to make a little segue here. One of my favorite bands, it's a band from Chicago called Tortoise. They released, their latest record is called The Catastrophist. And obviously when they announced it, I was, I was very happy to see that, that, that some people are taking this into consideration. Do you think that the, um, the current priorities, if you were in a position in government, uh, will you use this information to to influence the priorities that we have as a society in terms of where we put our money? For example, climate change versus comet spotting, things like that. Do you think those priorities are well balanced now, uh, and or does it is something that worries you? Not immediately. Um, still, the, the chances of a the chances of an asteroid impact sufficient to, to cause global devastation are really very small. Mm -hmm. um, the chances of a, a comet impact causing the same thing uh, are a bit higher, about probably about 10 times higher. So I think um, there is certainly 
the the, um, the asteroid detecting programs that currently exist, I think they would be advised to look beyond the inner solar system and, and to try to track and discover the large comets in the outer solar system where they have the potential to come in. Um, so as far as just the astronomy is concerned, yeah, I think uh, I think it's kind of now shown that um, NASA and other bodies are more or less looking in the wrong place. Uh-huh. And again, that's that's part of the reason why this is so controversial because so much money has been spent on mm. uh, detecting asteroids. To suddenly say, ah, yeah, but asteroids are only about one tenth of the the risk compared to comets that uh, actually we need to we need to be looking elsewhere. That that is also uh, it's hard for some people to accept that have spent their lives looking for asteroids, essentially. Um, uh, this, this, uh, every time you say torrid meteor stream, I remember that one of the questions I wanted to ask you was about the symbology of the bull, that it's something that you also touch in your work a little bit. And by the way, I was laughing when I was reading this, that there is a bull in the middle of Wall Street, right? Uh, the, the Mary Lynch, the famous statue of the Mary, <laughs> of the Mary Lynch bull. Uh, this is just a joke. I mean, that came to my mind as soon as I heard it. And so the question is going to come twofold here. Just just talk to us a little bit, because I mean, apparently uh, that's also coded in Gobakli Tepe. Apparently, uh, there is a chance that the, the, the event may have come from the torrid meteor stream. Am, am I right? Yeah. So this means that one of the things that it means is that perhaps Kobakli Tepe is coding that information for us as well and suggesting where it came from. Uh, so I would like to ask you if we let's see if we can connect this. I would like to ask you to talk to, to us a little bit about the symbology of the bull, which I find fascinating. And I would like you to think for a second if you have seen echoes of this manifested in modernity, because once again, I don't think these things are interrupted by time. I think these things are are built in our in our in our minds you know, because of how our brains work. So by any chance, and that's why I connect with the Mary Lynch bull. So I close the question and I repeat it. Talk to us a little bit about the symbology of the bull and have you seen manifestations of this in present culture? Present culture? Well, I haven't really thought about present culture, <laughs> to be honest, but I can go back. <laughs> you don't have to I answer that. Back. It's just funny, funny thought that came to my mind. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I can go back to um, the earliest case where it seems that um, we have this bull symbol indicating a, a cosmic impact is Lasco Cave. So the Lasco Cave is, mm-hmm. is probably the most famous cave art of all. And uh, there is this shaft scene in the Lasco Cave where you have a bull, a rhinoceros, a bird, and on the rear wall you have a horse. And also in this scene you have uh, what appears to be a man uh, dying or being killed or falling uh-huh. over. And and so you have these four animal symbols, yet again, and a dying man. So it, it seems, if you compare that with Pillar 43, it seems to be almost the same kind of picture. And so again, if we interpret these four animal symbols as, as a date using the zodiacal method, we get uh, the date 17, uh, well, 15,000, 200 or so BC. And now the bull in this scene is pierced by, oops, the bull in this scene is pierced by a spear. And uh, at that time, the bull uh, would have been representing the comp- constellation Capricornus, according to this theory. And Capricornus, the constellation Capricornus, um, well, that's the direction from which the Taurid meteor stream would have emanated at that time. So we can interpret the Lascaux shaft scene as another memorial to a cosmic impact, just like Pillar 43 at Gubekli Tepe. It's, it's essentially the same I see. kind of thing. So we're making this connection now between two pieces of artwork, which were thought to be completely different, which in my view are actually essentially the same thing, just different dates. Uh, and very interestingly, um, if we look at the date now that we've interpreted for the Lascaux shaft scene, which is 15,200 BC, there is another climate fluctuation in the in mm. the uh, in one of which is evident from one of the um, ice cores, uh, Greenland ice cores. So we can see a climate fluctuation there. Even more interestingly, there is um, if you look at all the radiocarbon dates from many different uh, sites uh, across uh, the south of France, which is where the Lascaux shaft scene is, you find that there is a, a massive gap of a few thousand years, beginning around about 
15,200 or so BC. So in other words, there was like a population bottleneck, and this is clearly clearly documented in the radiocarbon dates of these archaeological sites. There was a, a population bottleneck in southern France exactly at the time that we read wow. the, the date for. So uh, I think our interpretation for this Lascaux Chassis is, is pretty strong. So that's the first instance where we have the bull, getting back to your question. <laughs> yeah, they told with the question, yeah. I mean, there are earlier bull paintings, which are presumably tracking the solstices and equinoxes at different times, but this is the first case where we see the bull is connected to a cosmic impact. And I, I'm suggesting <clears throat> that possibly this, this is like it begins a mythology of connecting the bull with cosmic impacts. And we see this, this symbol represented in many, many later cultures. We see it at Quebec Tepe, where there's one of the, the main pillars. Um, there, are, there, are, there are several enclosures at Quebec Tepe, but the, the oldest one has a pair of central pillars. And one of these pillars has um, a Bucranian kind of necklace and a, and a Bucranian is basically a bull skull. So we see this bull skull on one of the main pillars at Quebec Tepe. Um, the bull is known from the, the Minoans. We see it in Egypt. It's it's always a um, it's often a symbol that's associated. And with... also in the, if I'm not mistaken, in the Mesopotamian, um, in the Epic of Gilgamesh yeah. as well, right? Exactly. So we have the bull of heaven, uh, and this idea of the bull of heaven. So this this cosmic impact. <laughs> it's so uncanny. Uh, it, it's it's absolutely explicit in the Gilgamesh <laughs> story, but it's also there in Egypt as well. So we have the uh, the myth that's associated with Hathor. So Hathor is another, um, well, actually a female cow deity in that case. But we have the myth of Hathor, who is known to be a sky deity, who then um, comes down and, and punishes mankind uh, and destroys mankind. So there are all there are consistently references uh, to bulls and destruction. There's another case where... Um, I forget which civilization it is exactly, but the, this, this is an Anatolian um, um, people or civilization from about the second millennium BC, I think. And in their case, their storm god rides on the back of two bulls mm. who are said to feast on the ruins of cities. Yeah. It, so, and we have something similar in um, North India, where we have um, Shiva uh, and uh, uh, rides on the back of Nandi. Uh, the bull. So there are all these very, very similar connections. And, and so this, is, I, sus I suspect that much of this is very ancient and it's filtered through into many, many cultures, this connection between cosmic destruction and, and the bull. Yeah, as, as you were answering this, uh, uh, an idea came to my mind, which is that there is this, um, and again, I don't claim to be a scientist at all. Just I'm just talking with you as a friend and sharing my thoughts. Um, uh, there is this relationship, there is this uh, activity in Spain, which is the, the bull run, right? Uh, I don't know how it's called in English. So what an interesting thing. It's a dance with the bulls, right? And I mean, it, it can be connected to the fact that bulls react to the color red in that way. I don't know. But but you see, I, I don't take these things lightly because uh, our no, minds... I, I... I suspect there is a connection because this 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 um, uh, bull baiting in particular is is associated with the Basque region of, of Spain and the Basque population is known to have quite a quite an ancient um, ancestry, if you like. So there there really could be a connection there between the bull yes. baiting or bull running and um, and what a, what a fascinating symbol. fact that it's it's a dance, right? And and that seems to be. In a certain way, what we're doing, I mean, with this meteor stream, because because what people don't understand as well is that most likely, if this theory is correct, there is a very strong likelihood that the comet originated from that region. And every year when we see the debris hitting the Earth and we go to a park and just to look at it, well, this is a really bone chilling <laughs> fact that, that there is a very big likelihood that that was the source of, of one of the major catastrophes that humanity ever faced. And and in here I take I take the mic for a second to, to say something that in the in the epicenter of our conversation that I find the most important part for me for what's in here for me people ask me so what is what's in there like why why should I care and I I always say man the thing is that if you understand the physics of such an impact if you if you would sit down and just think about it for a second what it means for the geology and the climate of the planet for such an event to happen. And you would understand that every single person who is alive now is the descendant of an ancestor who survived that. 
then you will feel fearless. You will feel fearless towards anything that life is going to throw at you. You will feel capable of surviving anything. Because that event, if, if true, which you and I believe is true, and the evidence that, that supports it, that it has been provided, is overwhelming. It means that we should really, really ride on the shoulders of those giants who survived and, and decided to stay alive. I, I, as I was telling you, I have a one-year-old baby. Just try to imagine having a one-year-old baby during the Younger Dryas impact days. And, and then they, they pull it through. And I think it's really important that people take this in. That's a message I want to convey, is that first, your history is way much older than what you think. And this matters. This matters because it means that you are, you know, if, if anybody who listens to this is a surfer, you know, the, the, the more water the, the wave carries, the more powerful your surfing experience will be. And the, underestimating that wave will make you fall if you're a surfer. And I think it's important that we do not underestimate the wave that we are surfing as a society, as a collective and as an individual. And that firstly, that wave is way more ancient than what we think. And secondly, that the resilience of our ancestors really gives us the cosmic responsibility to be a as resilient and b to honor that effort <laughs> that they made that that's why that's why this touched me really when i when i started listening to the to the effects that this would have on the planet and to imagine that somebody with a baby survived that i would well, like a great film wouldn't it <laughs> it's really imagine great film. a hollywood blockbuster it, it would, I mean, there, there are two yeah. mm -hmm. there are two, two Two key reasons why I was uh, really interested in this. I think the first is because of our future. That's really the, the key yeah. for me. That um, you know, the, the Torrid meter stream is out there. There are other giant comets in the outer solar system that, that can come in. And although, because of the way the Torrid meter stream uh, processes and orbits, uh, at the moment we're in a low risk region of time, essentially for the next five to eight hundred years. Uh, we're in a, a, like a low risk epoch, but the the, the, the torrid meteor stream will begin to strengthen again in our skies, and we'll see this, uh, and we'll soon, uh, and by about three thousand AD, we'll reach another peak of intensity mm. uh, of the torrid meteor stream, and depending on how much of the torrid meteor stream has decayed, uh, we could be at risk again from from more of these kinds of impact. So that's that's the key thing is you know, in, in about 800 years or so, we need to be uh, looking at the skies carefully again. The other reason is looking back and that, as you're saying, you know, we have this amazing shared history. We're not also separated peoples. Our, our cultures are actually, um, many of them are sort of converging back to this point in time, this younger Dryas impact, yes. when, when many of the world's current religions, many of the world's dominant religions today, probably, if you go back far enough, had their origin, essentially as comet cults. I once heard an interesting question, which was, how are ancient people, if, if there was not such an event, how are ancient peoples knew that comets are dangerous? If there was not such an event. Yeah, so I think... Um, and probably there wasn't just the one event, you know, yeah. according to this, this notion that there, there, there would have been many, maybe not so large ones, but there would have been many. So I think it's, uh, yeah, this, this, this whole idea that comets are dangerous, they spell doom, uh, is kind of deeply rooted in, uh, in the I think that also in, in people's reaction to, towards this information, apart from the modern cynicism of who cares, uh, it doesn't affect my day-to-day -day life kind of thing, there is also a denial of the fact that this is a real danger and that it can happen and that people it's kind of like when 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 your son ignores looking at his dirty room because he doesn't want to clean it you know and i think it's important that uh, slowly uh, everybody who carries this information close to our skins just just sits down on the pub you know and start talking with people make a podcast discuss it and in the case of a person like you and that's i want to publicly thank you so much you, you have built a body of work that 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 just really helps the the layman like me to push the idea and so ra wrapping this up ending to thanking us towards the end of the podcast i want to talk about uh, what what uh, several things that people can google because i mean your work is so extensive and i loved it and i know that some people are just going to be like oh man i don't want to watch like this 10 hours of videos i just want to go to the point so so um, uh, there are three 
uh, news on nature. Uh, there, there are two publications of nature and one on NASA's uh, Goddard Institute that I think are quite interesting. And I want to know if you consider this powerful um, uh, fast evidence that people can just Google, grab and take home. And I'm talking about the findings in Chile in 2019 and the findings in Syria in 2020 that are both published in Nature magazine. And later we will go to that Greenland crater, if, if you're okay with that. Yeah, uh, so uh, the, the people have, since the impact hypothesis was developed, people have been trying to work out and, and debating the extent of the damage, you know, how, how far uh, how, how much of the Earth's surface was actually affected by this. And so there's this, this is a recent report which shows that even at the, you know, the south of South America, uh, we find this, this thing known as the Younger Dryas black mat, which is this layer in the sediment, which essentially catalogues or is the sort of event horizon for, for this impact. So it, even the, from South America up to the north of North America, across into Europe, even into um, Western Asia, we see this, this younger dry as black mat. So it covers about half of the hemisphere. Now then there is this, um, there was a recent paper about uh, one of the world's first villages uh, called Abu Huraira, mm -hmm. which was um, destroyed by an immense fire. So that much is known and accepted, but, but the debate has been in the, in the academic circles, was this fire caused by was it just a house fire or was it destroyed by this, this cosmic impact, this younger dry impact? And so now this, this new paper that's come out, that I think has put that to bed, that it was actually destroyed by the younger dry impact. And, and they can tell this from the, the geochemistry, the, the little tiny uh, microspherals that are left behind. They can, they can see what kind of temperature this, this fire uh, took place at, and it's, it's over 2000 degrees Celsius. And that, that implies it must've been a cosmic impact that destroyed one of the world's first villages. Now, the interesting thing from, from my point of view is that this little village, Abu Huraira, which existed about uh, 13,000 years ago, is only about 100 miles from Gebekli Tepe. So the, the people at Gebekli Tepe uh, in that region, they would almost certainly have witnessed this event. At and the dating of this event is, is uh, I, I know the answer to that, but I want to hear your answer. The dating of this event matches Yes, so the, 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 the radiocarbon dating of this event at Abu Huraira, this burned layer, agrees extremely well with um, the date of the Younger Dress yep. impact and, and therefore with Pillar 43. So, yeah, it all ties together. So that's one and then of, of the course, things. Yeah, uh -huh. carry on. No, no, I, I wanted to guide the conversation. So that's one of the things we're talking about, uh, the Abu Huraira uh, event in Syria, which was recently... I mean, I saw this all over the news and all over social media. I don't know if it, it's the same on your world. Yes, yeah, yeah. It was uh, quite prominent. And that I actually made a, a video, which I put onto YouTube. It's excellent. Uh, to, to talk about that, that paper and how it relates to uh, the decoding of Ubekita. And then, of course, you have these craters in Greenland, which I think you mentioned as well. Yes. So this, these craters, if anybody wants to find the information, I'm just, I'm going to put it in the description anyways, but so you see, I'm not hacking anything. You can just Google nature magazine, Syria, younger dryas, and you will get this. And if also, if you search nature magazine, Chile, younger dryas, you will also get evidence from uh, important findings that have been uh, undercovered in uh, the South of the American continent, which also point towards the same theory. And the other thing that you should, investigate if you're interested in this topic is a uh, nice sorry nasa younger dryas crater and you're going to get two separate uh, periods of nasa's history in which there is some information revealed about this can you talk us a little bit about this crater and what do you think yeah so this is massive this massive crater about uh, i think it's 30 kilometers wide uh, that was discovered quite recently off the northwest coast partially of Greenland, partially hidden by um, the, the ice field there, uh, which is why it was, it, it's only recently been uh, discovered. So that, that crater is, is quite clear. Um, what isn't known, and it's massive, what isn't known exactly is, is how old it is. Um, but because of the way that the ice flows across Greenland, 
and the ice would have scoured the, the bedrock, for that crater to still exist, it must be relatively young. Exactly. Uh, so there is this idea that this, this might be the smoking gun, this might be the, you know, one of the main, if not the main impact crater for the Younger Dryas event. Now the Younger Dryas event is not just a single, is not thought to be just a single impact. It's thought to have been a distributed impact from many fragments of comet. Uh, and the comet was, the comet was already fragmented uh, as it was orbiting in the solar system. It was breaking up gradually. Uh, and then perhaps um, you know, a couple of large fragments and, and maybe many hundreds or even thousands of smaller fragments is what we collided with at, at this time. So if this is the case, then, um, then this crater in Greenland would be you know, like one of the main impact sites. But we don't know that yet. We don't know exactly how old this crater is. However, there is another crater, or at least there is, there is proposed to be another crater uh, not so far away, again, under the ice in Greenland. Uh, now, this hasn't been confirmed. This, this, you can see this geological structure through, through radar underneath the ice, but it hasn't been confirmed as an impact crater yet, unlike the first one. <clears throat> but if it is confirmed to be an imp impact crater, and I'm sure people are looking at this, then what you've got there are two impact craters close together, large, because this the secondary impact crater is also about 30 kilometers wide. You'd have two impact craters close together in Greenland under the ice. Now for them to both still exist, supposing they are both craters, would mean that they would both have to be quite young because the ice on Greenland is constantly scouring the bedrock. So to have two relatively young craters close together, the probability that these are disconnected events is, is very small. So if this second impact crater is, or this second structure is an impact crater, then it implies that these uh, two craters were formed essentially at the same time during the same event. Uh, so that would then put two massive craters into, into view for the Younger Dryas impact. Do you have uh, conversations in your circles? I mean, when you sit down in the cafeteria of the university, uh, with other professors, I mean, is this, is this something? How, how now getting out of the of the actual evidence and things and wrapping it up? Uh, how how do you handle this information in your day to day life? Is it is it is it something that transforms your life and that you speak a lot with friends apart from your YouTube channel, or is it something that you keep for yourself? Yeah, I mean, it's certainly transformed my life <laughs> um, in terms of the book and all all the YouTube uh, videos that I'm making. So it. Yeah, my life certainly changed quite a lot. But uh, when I talk to colleagues as well at uh, in the university, they're very interested, um, generally, uh, and actually very supportive, uh, which I appreciate. So uh, they can see, like me, um, you know, that they've been kind of interested in my work. They've been following what's going on, and they can see, like me, that actually there is a, a really strong story here. So uh, we don't we don't have extensive discussions that go into impact craters and the younger Dryas impact evidence, but. Um, Certainly just around the possibility of an impact and whether it was recorded at Quebec Tepe and the notion of the of an ancient zodiac is something that my colleagues are generally interested mm -hmm. in. It seems like the anthropologists and, uh, and the historians are the ones that are more wary. Because, I mean, it would just rock their whole world. It would be like like discovering a new kind of atom. <laughs> and, then, yeah. and then the physicists will be like, no, 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 no I don't want this. <laughs> something like that. <laughs> well, that's, that's true. So the people that I meet day to day uh, at work are, are engineers or sure. chemists or, or physicists. So yeah, I don't uh, typically have conversations with archaeologists or anthropologists. Um, yeah, so I'm, I don't know how they would take it uh, exactly. Well, I hope, I hope that this uh, work continues um, flourishing. I mean, it's really fascinating and it certainly has captivated the minds of thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people, uh, thanks to people like you, we can, uh, the people who are not, don't have a scientific training, we can feel a little bit more confident of, of what we're feeling and, and what we consider to be important. Um, I would like to wrap it up. Well, apart from giving you a great thank you, just to encourage you to continue. I know that, like, you know, I'm an artist and uh, whenever you push something original, you have everything against you. And uh, I know that this is not easy. I, again, I'm not into the conspiracy theory that there are scientists there trying to stop you. It's just that, I mean, whenever you bring an original idea to the table, the natural reaction is like, well, I mean, look, I, I have this life going on. Why should I pay attention to that? And uh, 
uh, I hope that you find uh, rewarding that there are really, really, really hundreds of thousands of people who feel this idea and these concepts and are really thankful for what you're doing. Thanks very much. So, well, uh, I will put in the description all the information that relates to your work. Please, everybody engage. There is a book called Prehistory Decoded that is really fascinating. And the YouTube channel is full of amazing information. Uh, I hope that we can have another conversation in the future because I still feel that there are so many things that we can talk about this topic. And, um, and well, I hope everybody en enjoyed this uh, conversation. Is there anything you would like to say to wrap it up? No, just that. Thank you uh, for having me on your show. Great, man. So everybody, please get activated, support Martin's work and go to the description and you will find everything you need to find there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you. Have a great day. Cheers.